Hello, I'm Chris Pradel. I'm Kalamazoo City Commissioner, and I'm joined here today with uh, Public Services Director James Baker. Uh, we're here to talk about water quality and um, just wa water in general in our uh, community, and uh, just hopefully answer some questions and dispel some myths and uh, make sure that uh, everybody in the public feels a little bit more in tune with, with uh, how this vitally important system works uh, for our community. So, hey, Director Baker. How are you doing? You know, and thank you. I like talking about water. Yeah, no, it's great. I uh, one thing that I have greatly appreciated in my a little over a year being a commissioner is the fact that I, uh, you know, I've toured the water reclamation plant. I've had an opportunity to interact with you on a number of occasions, and members of the team who are part of public services, and and uh, it's it's great to see that. Um, you know, not only you, but your team are so passionate about this work and, you know, really care about, um, you know, making sure that um, that our water system remains safe and healthy for everybody. And so, um, you know, thanks for every, everything you and your team do to, to keep the community safe. Um, uh, so we'll start off here. Uh, you know, some people uh, will periodically post and, and uh, make a post on a Facebook page for a neighborhood and you know, you might see a picture of somebody who says, hey, my, my uh, water is discolored. You know, there's something aesthetically off with my, my water and you see their tub filled and it looks, you know, yellow or slightly brown or, or, or something along those lines. Can you, can you help us understand, um, you know, what are some of the causes for this aesthetic or, or discoloration of water? Uh, you know, how does that happen? Well, thank you. Uh, you know, let me first talk about our system characteristics and what are some trends that are inherent to the way our system is. Mm -hmm. our, system is an all groundwater system okay uh, that's water that's sourced underground from the from the ground we're the largest groundwater system in michigan and so that groundwater that we draw is naturally high in iron mm -hmm. minerals and high in hardness okay and that's pretty typical for this water source okay now uh, we have 13 stations or 13 treatment plants okay. uh, that we utilize to provide all the water for the regional system mm -hmm. And of those 13 stations, we only have two stations that employ what we call full-scale iron removal. Okay. Uh, the remaining stations all employ a process that we call iron sequestration, uh, and that is a process that kind of binds up and, and treats the iron, but it's not the same as a full iron treatment. Okay. Uh, so I know that uh, you describe it as acute or like transient situations. So these are situations that are kind of like come and go you know they're not they should ideally are situations that shouldn't be permanent or persist long term what are some of the situations that could be acute or, or transient situations like that that people could encounter yeah certainly you know we talked about you know the source water it's, it's high in iron you know so we we do understand that iron's going to be accumulating in uh, that pipe system that pipe distribution system our system's got over 800 miles of water main wow. now we do come out twice a year we come out every spring we come out every fall and we perform hydrant flushing. That's a maintenance process that we do to help remove that uh, sediment and the iron okay. that's in those pipes. But we also experience, like you said, acute or transient occurrences where uh, for no particular reason, the water's starting to turn a little yellow or mm -hmm. become discolored. Okay. And so essentially what's going on there is that there's changes in hydraulic demand uh, within the system and uh, that could be caused by uh, bringing new wells or stations online, uh, boosting or bleeding water into other districts, uh, use of hydrants, there could be a fire to sure. where you know, we're drawing from a hydrant or the fire or public safety is drawn from a hydrant. Uh, construction of new water mains, mm -hmm. uh, they have to be tested and pressurized and so they're drawing a large amount of water to fill them. Uh, we also have you know, repair of water mains and distribution valve operations and things like that. So there's things that are happening in the system which could cause something like that. So those are the things that situations that would, you know, suddenly shift shift the water and force it in a certain direction, uh, different from where it would normally go, or at a uh, you know, higher pressure than usual. Correct. So, you know, a system that's got iron in it already, uh, we talked about we come out twice a year to, to flush the lines, mm -hmm. uh, but what happens when we've got these acute or transient events that are occurring is that uh, there's a sudden maybe change in water direction mm -hmm. so the water was going one way now it's moving and going the other okay. or it's going in the same way but it's going much faster in those veins and oh. what happens there's a scouring effect now the uh the the iron that's deposited in the main that's now brought back into a solution and sure. now it's getting carried into the transmission mains 
distribution mains, and ultimately into your homes, and that's where folks are seeing that water discoloration. Um, so that explains if you've wondered why you see the green flashing lights out at night in the spring and the fall, why you see the hydrants getting flushed. Uh, so uh, it's part of that process to try to keep, uh, you know, keep uh, discoloration issues or aesthetic issues in, in water. And I, obviously, there's other reasons as well, but that's a big part of it, I, is, I guess. Uh, so uh, the other thing I know uh, there there are situations where you might have somebody where they're uh, having an issue that's maybe localized to their household versus an issue that's, you know, maybe an actual system issue, like maybe one of the lines, like some of the issues you're describing. Uh, is, there, is there a way that you can help people understand, you know, how to differentiate between those two situations and tell, like, oh, this might be an issue that is caused by something temporary because of the city versus, like, you know, maybe something in your house is causing the issue? Um, yeah, certainly. You know, anytime any customer, any one of our citizens, or any member of the water system, whether they're in the townships or the city, you know, anywhere, anytime they experience a static water quality issue, we would ask those folks to give us a call. Okay. Uh, you can call us at 311, or if you're outside the city limits, you can give us a call at 269 337 8000. And you don't have to call us during the event, but we would like to understand when you know, what date and then what time, you mm -hmm. know, maybe not exactly, um, but what time, you know, was it around lunch? Uh, if you can be as specific to say, hey, it was at 12 or if it was at one o'clock. Mm -hmm. And what that is gonna do is help us determine what is the cause of that mm -hmm. and also what is the solution needed. Now, a lot of these transient events can clear themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll come through, uh, they'll stir up the water mains, they'll, they'll provide some discoloration and then they'll clear right back up again. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes, say if you're away f at work, if you're not in your home, you're not using your water, homes don't use a lot of water in perspective to say like what the main uses. Mm. And so that service line between you and the water main uh, could have the discoloration in it still. And sometimes the, re the response or repair is as simple as you're just getting flushing out your house. Mm -hmm. And so we ask that you call so we can help kind of coordinate and understand is this a large area, is this a localized area, or is this you know, one particular house? Sure. And what we're gonna do, we'll utilize GIS, we'll plot all these uh, address locations of these calls, mm -hmm. and then we'll respond with either a localized flushing crew to clear that main, mm -hmm. um, or we'll continue troubleshooting with the homeowner. Now, when you call us, one of the things that we are gonna ask you to do mm -hmm is to run the furthest fixture from the water meter. Usually that's like your kitchen sink or if you have an upstairs bathroom, uh, that would be the upstairs bathroom, the cold water mm -hmm. for a period of five to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And we're not trying to blow you off. It, and I really wanna stress that. And what we're trying to do is determine if we can get the house to draw clear water from the main mm -hmm. or is it getting worse as we draw more? Mm -hmm. And that's going to really help us and uh, determine what's the cause of that. Uh, so we'll ask that uh, you hang the phone up, you go uh, perform that job, go run that water for five to ten minutes, mm -hmm. and then give us a call back. And mm -hmm. you know, take a look: is it is it water clarity improving over time, or is it getting worse? And sure. we'll ask: is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Mm -hmm. And so that can kind of help us narrow it down to see if okay, the main is now clear and mm -hmm. we're getting clear water to the home mm -hmm. or the main is still running discolored. Sure. And that will help us when we come out to do our flushing of the main. Because um, ultimately we, we've got to clear that main first. We've mm -hmm. got to get the, the water in the main to run clear mm -hmm. before we can get working on the house to get the house to run clear. And people need to be somewhat comfortable understanding too that, you're, that the city will ask them to, to, to hang up the phone so they can go you know, test this out and give them the full time. Don't try to cut it short and be like, well, I've tried it for three minutes. Give them the full fledged time that you ask them to, to run the water. The other thing as well is that, you know, you mentioned it's important that it's the cold water they'll ask people to run, which can kind of clue people in as well sometimes because say if it's a hot water heater issue, right, that can kind of clue people in to say, well, maybe that's something internally, um, you know, that's causing an issue. Right. Um, so if it's, if it's just the cold water, you know, this is direct, you know, from city line type situation. So it helps clue that in as well, right? Right, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it, it could be something that's isolated to 
the the hot water heater. Mm -hmm. You know, we know our hot water heaters uh, corrode over time. You mm -hmm. could be getting some corrosion mm -hmm. or, or sediment that's built up in a hot water mm -hmm. heater. The other thing too, when we're trying to flush out sediment, we're trying to flush out discoloration from the line. We don't want you to run the hot because we don't want you to run more of that sediment. If it is the scenario where it's getting worse, right? We don't want you to pull more of that into your hot water heater. Interesting. Okay, good to know. So it's also preventative to cause issues with your hot water heater if it is something that's just kind of running through the lines uh, as well. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so they need to make sure they give you the, do it the full time, stick with it the amount of time that you tell them, and then make sure to call back and you know report back about what's happening, what you're seeing. So uh, you could get a sense of that. I know one of the things that you've, you've told me as well that uh, is helpful also to figure out whether it's a localized or a, a larger issue is to talk to your neighbors, right? So uh, go across the street, talk to the person across the street, talk to the person to the left and to your right and figure out are they having similar issues because that might um, clue you into some things as well. Correct, that really helps us out. You know, if you're talking to your neighbor, say on the opposite side of the street, mm -hmm. um, talk to your neighbors either side of you. Mm -hmm. um, that's gonna help us, you know, are they seeing the same problems that you're seeing mm -hmm. um, are you know the folks on your side of the street seeing it but not the folks on the other mm -hmm. and you know vice versa that really tries to help us narrow it down you know and ultimately what we're trying to determine is the, is the main clear and we can check that by the hydrants we'll come out to the hydrants mm -hmm. can we get clear water out of the hydrant mm -hmm. and if we can then we need to focus on the home okay. what do we need to do to get clear water sure. out of the home sure okay all right, so let's say there's a situation where a homeowner, you know, they've called 311, they've tried running their water, they've talked to their neighbors, uh, you know, they've, they've run through all these steps and nothing improves, you know. And, and maybe we've even got to the point where um, the city comes out and even flushes the hydrant or something. Um, you know, what are, what, are, what are next steps that somebody could look at to try to really try to drill down and resolve the problem? You know, what, what does the city do once they've gotten to a point where, okay, all the things we've tried to troubleshoot, they're not working. Um, what would be a next step? Yeah, you know, great question. You know, we've gotten situations before where the main is clear, the hydrants are running clear, mm -hmm. there's um, not an issue with the water main on the city side of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, the best troubleshooting that we can do for the homeowner at that point is that we will schedule what we call a service flush. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll actually uh, make an appointment with the customer We've got to come down, access where the meter is. Uh, we'll pull the meter assembly completely out. Uh, we'll hook on uh, some hose, hose lines. We'll run those hose lines outside. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to high velocity flush that service line. You know, so we're going to flush out from the main through that service line mm -hmm. and then flush out okay. any material and get that service line to run clear. We'll also take a look at the meter. We can service the meter or flush out that meter to verify that. Okay. And then so at that point, we verified that the hydrants are running clear, the service line is running clear, and through the meter is running clear. Okay. At that point, uh, the, that is the end of the city responsibility. Now, we have under, an understanding that homes with galvanized pipe have experienced uh, a unique type of corrosion. Galvanized pipe will corrode from the inside mm. um, towards the water main, reducing the size or inner diameter mm -hmm. of that galvanized pipe. Mm -hmm. And that boundary layer, that initial layer that's right kind of touching the water uh, can really provide uh, a lot of sediment and discoloration just due to that corrosion okay. of, of those pipes. And so, it, and we'll work with the homeowner and really we wanna demonstrate to the homeowner uh, so that they can visualize, so they can see Okay, here's my service line, it's running clear. Here's uh, my meter that's pulled and they, we can see it's running clear out of it. Mm -hmm. And then usually, and we've had this uh, occur before where we can actually show the homeowner the galvanized plumbing and see inside it to where that corrosion oh, wow. is okay. occurring. Um, and at, at that point, um, the city does not do any work inside the home in terms of uh, the plumbing, your, your plumbing inside your house. Mm -hmm. uh, we would recommend that uh, you you know, contact a, a local plumber and work with them to, you know, replace to some other material inside the home, sure. such as copper or something like that. Sure. Now, if the service line that we talked about, if that is galvanized, mm -hmm. um, that would fall under our 
uh, lead copper program for a free replacement. Okay. You know, so whether it's a lead line or a galvanized line, you know, any line that's not copper, mm -hmm. it's going to be replaced. Okay. And uh, we have projects where we've identified currently, or right now we're in East Side and East Wood. Mm -hmm. We're going to work that whole area. Um, next year, we're going to be moving into kind of our North Kalamazoo area. We're going to work that whole area out. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, any area that is experiencing problems or any home that's testing over any kind of limit, uh, we will uh, prioritize that replacement and we'll get that replaced. So if any homeowner, you know, just even if, if they didn't suspect any issues, but just wanted to be safe and, or, and, and check in, could they call and, you know, have their home tested? Yeah, certainly. You know, if somebody has a concern, maybe they don't know if their home is served by mm -hmm. um, a material that's not copper. Mm -hmm. um, they can give us a call at 311 or 337-8000 mm -hmm. and just um, state, hey, I don't know what my pipe material is. Yeah. Um, do we have a record of it? And oftentimes we'll, we'll be able to pull that record by address and we can tell you right then, okay. you know, hey, no, you, you've got copper mm -hmm. or you've got one of these non-copper um, or undefined and undefined um, we don't know what it is okay and there is a the high likelihood that it is lead Split. or uh, one of those other materials that are non-copper gotcha and we can schedule you for it's free testing we can come out and test for lead okay. and see where you're at and we also recommend that uh, if you're not served by a copper service line mm -hmm. uh, that you use a NSF certified filter that's certified to remove lead and we'll provide that free mm -hmm. for you I know uh, recently uh, City announced a partnership with Consumers Energy as well uh, as another uh, you know resource to, to homeowners as well where uh, Consumers Energy can come out and do a full home energy audit as well which includes you know looking at ways to save water and uh, you know come save on utilities and whatnot as well so they can call and do that as well um, if I understand correctly. Yeah that's a great program and, and let me talk about that for a second it's uh, really it's an energy reduction program mm -hmm. and um, the, the reason why the water department and consumers energy are coming together on this is that when we think about the use of hot water, whether that's for laundry or showers or, or cooking or you know, hygiene or anything like that, you're probably using water, mm -hmm. which is uh, an expense for, for you, mm -hmm. deals with the water utility, and you're probably using some sort of heat, either an electric hot water heater or you're using a gas hot water heater. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of see there's some alignment there. Mm -hmm. And so if uh, folks have um, appliances that are older, that are using a lot of energy, they're probably not very efficient. Mm -hmm. And when appliances aren't efficient, customers are paying more for that energy usage. Mm -hmm. So with this consumer's program, um, you've got the ability to do a home energy audit. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got uh, the ability to do that remotely if customers have concerns with with COVID or allowing people into their home, mm -hmm. uh, they can actually kind of uh, use their phone if they have a phone that does, um, you know, like the video chatting, the video chatting or whatever. You can kind of walk through the home with the mm -hmm. representative, That's neat. Uh, or you can have somebody in the home. Okay. And then for um, specifically for income qualified customers, uh, some of those replacements may be covered with oh, the program. Okay. Oh, neat. Um, so uh, folks that are um, in an income qualifying. Uh, area that uh, can actually get uh, some of those appliances is covered. Okay. Uh, and for folks that don't income qualify, uh, there may be other programs or at least the identification of, you know, what appliances, you know, maybe it's a hot water heater mm -hmm. and what uh, effect that might be having on some of your utility bills. Okay. Awesome. Well, yeah, this is all really helpful. I mean, so there's a lot of resources that people can depend on if they, and really all they have to do to start this process is, you know, dial 311. In most cases, and I know uh, the Consumers Energy Program, I believe, is they have to contact somebody separately to do that. But correct, um, correct. We can help them get there through mm -hmm. three on one. Mm -hmm. um, but that is that is a separate. There will be a separate call mm -hmm. that will be placed uh, to talk to consumers for yep. uh, in the name of this program. This is our Helping Neighbors Program. Okay. Uh, and so that uh, we can get you there if you call three one one. Uh, we can also get you there if you go direct with consumers. Awesome, cool. Well, that's hopefully helpful for residents, you know, that are trying to process and think through, like, you know, how do I troubleshoot this? You know, how do I, uh, how can I envision this process going if, if things persist or if things don't get better? But it, it's good to know that there is a process that people can go through and uh, to get help and get answers if they want to. And, and hopefully if, if it does run to the end, 
point where they realize it's in the home, um, at least they have you know at least a prescription to understand like what it might be in their home that needs to be um, remedied to uh, solve the problem. So yeah, so thanks uh, for that. All right, so Director Baker, I know uh, you know one thing in, in in my short time here as a commissioner, uh, you know we we have increased rates in recent years and uh, for water and sewer, and you know as we have learned why that's necessary, I feel very uh, confident in making those decisions because, you know, I see uh, the great things that are happening under our feet that, uh, you know, are going to make our system uh, a system that we can be proud for, proud of for, for decades to come, you know, and, uh, you know, we take health and safety very seriously. We take uh, the fact that we want to make sure that there's a high quality of life here in this, you know, community and throughout our system for, for a long time to come. And, and, and the best way that we're going to do that are making these long overdue infrastructure improvements. And so, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll hear people when I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people on, on Facebook neighborhood groups or if, if somebody reaches out by email and they'll say, you know, I keep seeing my, my rates go up and yeah, I'm not seeing any, you know, infrastructure improvements on my street or in my neighborhood. And, you know, could you share a little bit about, about what, 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 is, what, what is happening that we're, you know, deciding to make those, those rate increases so that we can do these things? What's, what's happening? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and and certainly the citizens want to understand where that investment is occurring. Uh, so talking about our, our capital improvement program, which you know the the projects vary around year by year, but generally, if you look at our five year CIP, I say CIP, that's capital improvement plan. Mm -hmm. Our the general focus of that uh, really is on lead service line replacements, mm -hmm. cast iron main replacements, or cast iron pipe replacements. Mm -hmm. Uh, water towers and transmission mains, uh, water quality treatment, and automation improvements at the station. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at, say, a lead service line replacement, you're going to understand there's a direct benefit to that household that, that sees that. Mm -hmm. And as we work through neighborhoods, and currently we're in East Side, mm -hmm. City Kalamazoo, mm -hmm. East Wood, mm -hmm. Kalamazoo Township, mm -hmm. and homes in that area are seeing that direct benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, but they're also paying water bills and they're helping everybody achieve benefits as they move through. So the mm -hmm. whole system's paying a water bill. The benefit's happening there right now. Mm -hmm. Now, next year we're transitioning over to North Kalamazoo. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's still paying a water bill. Now those homes are seeing that direct benefit. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about uh, lead service line replacements, uh, this is mainly folks in city Kalamazoo, mainly folks in Kalamazoo Township, mm -hmm. and it's going to take us time. It's going to take us probably an additional 15 years from now mm -hmm. to get through everything. Mm -hmm. And everybody's paying, and when you benefit is going to vary depending on when you're in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, but that benefit will occur. Mm -hmm. Now, on the cast iron main replacements, uh, there there is benefit for larger areas. You know, as we increase reliability mm -hmm. of the system. We don't have those main breaks. Uh, those main breaks are also a contributing factor to those water quality issues we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, when folks are seeing the yellow water and the water discoloration, mm -hmm. uh, a big component of that is when we're having those main breaks. Mm -hmm. And so there's benefits for everybody, mm -hmm. benefits for an entire system mm -hmm. when we're reinvesting and replacing that, that, ca that cast iron. Mm -hmm. uh, as we talk about system-wide improvements, things like water towers, transmission loops, and then getting into the stations themselves and really focusing on the automation and the treatment at those stations. Again, this is benefiting everybody. Mm -hmm. You might not see us work on that water tower, put that water tower up, mm -hmm. but having that water tower really gives redundancy, reliability, make sure the water's there, mm -hmm. uh, gives us the ability to, you know, you've probably experienced a power outage in Kalamazoo, um, you know, maybe they're not as frequent as some of our rural areas out in the townships. I mean, mm -hmm. folks in the townships experience power outages too. Mm -hmm. um, did your water go off when the power outage occurred? It probably didn't. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, we've got that reliability and that redundancy, we've got the water in the air that we talk about mm -hmm. that, you know, helps to um, balance out demands. And, you know, it also helps when we lose power. Mm -hmm. And so those water towers are really important integral part to make sure that when you turn on that tap, water comes out. So the good example is the Siesta Tower, which 
most of us know as like the Kalamazoo Promise Tower, water tower off of 131. So what you're saying is like, that's not just, you know, serving just the immediate close proximity area just by that water tower. You know, that's having an impact on the entire water system, system-wide basically. Correct, there's a, there's a huge area. You know, you talk about just that, that one tower and we're serving that area that, that's pretty large. Mm -hmm. If you were to uh, say travel on I-94, mm -hmm. Um, that area that that tower is covering goes from you know 131 about where it's at. Yeah. It goes a little west of that. Yeah, uh, and it continues all the way east. If you drive all the way over to say the Galesburg exit, which is wow. 85, that tower is serving a housing community that's just south of the highway. Wow, um, and and many many Kalamazoo neighborhoods. Yeah, you uh, you also talked about the uh, transmission like looping as well and uh, you know how that impacts people so sometimes you know you might see that we approve a uh, project that's happening over and kind of like i think it's like the richland area you know so again it might not be super close proximity to where people see things but when those looping projects happen is that again something that you know is, is benefiting a larger system you know the larger system um, correct those transmission mains transmission loops if you will are critically important to re reliability of our mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. We have only 13 treatment plants or 13 water stations that are providing all the source water. Mm -hmm. uh, time to time, we have districts that are demanding more water than they're producing. Mm -hmm. And when that occurs, we have to rely on those transmission mains to boost in or bleed in water from mm -hmm. other stations and other districts to satisfy those demands. Mm -hmm. So those transmission mains are really kind of like the arteries that connect all these systems together and give us the flexibility to get more water into a district that's using it during a time of high demand and move water throughout all these districts at the same time. Sure. And that again goes back to that water is always there when you turn on the tap. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned, you know, you talked about the lead service lines and, you know, obviously there are some mandates by, by the state uh, in terms of progress and making that. But you know, one of the things I've been pretty proud of is that the Kalamazoo, city of Kalamazoo was really a leader on that before it was even required. Uh, I believe you mentioned to me at some point. And so, you know, we're, we're really aggressively trying to tackle that as a community as well. And so, um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the, you know, that's a great point. The, you know, city of Kalamazoo has been replacing lead service lines since uh, 1992, uh, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And they did so in coordination with street projects. They did so when they come upon them mm -hmm. uh, during excavation, uh, but they, we didn't necessarily have a date certain on when they were all gonna come out. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a lot of work studying all the records, um, verifying in the field some locations to kind of calibrate our records and make sure uh, that we had some confidence in the records mm -hmm. and that we trusted what they were telling us. Mm -hmm. uh, we found them to be overwhelmingly accurate mm -hmm. and uh, gave us a number of kind of what to shoot for. Mm -hmm. So in 2016, uh, we came to the city commission with a plan and uh, identified that we had approximately 10,000 uh, lead service lines, which would include you know, any portion, either street or yard as lead, mm -hmm. or any portion street or yard as galvanized, mm -hmm. or uh, any what we call undefines, which you know could be copper, they could be uh, lead, or they could be galvanized. Mm -hmm. And so, because uh, we didn't know at the time, we said, okay, let's count those as something we're going to replace mm -hmm. to ensure that they're they're copper. Mm -hmm. uh, so, having said that, we identified about ten thousand, which set us on the pace for a twenty-year plan to replace five hundred a year. Mm -hmm. And so, starting in two thousand seventeen. The city has been committed and has averaged at least 500 replacements per year since 2017. Uh, so that will put us on target uh, to have everything done by 2037, uh, and that will be ahead of the state required mandate. Mm -hmm. uh, the lead and copper rule of 2018 from the state of Michigan. Uh, detailed exact dates on when municipalities had to have all of their lead service lines replaced. Okay. Uh, you've talked a little bit before about, um, you know, we work with uh, Eagle on this uh, implement, on implementing the uh, optimized corrosion control uh, and having that in all of our stations. And can you describe that a little bit about what that looks like and, and what that aims to achieve for our water system? 
Yeah, that's a great point. You know, and this gets back to to kind of the, um, you know, I, I see the rates going up. I understand the investments. I'm on a copper service. I'm not going to get a lead service. You know, what's in it for me? Mm. And we've got an agreement with Eagle in place to implement what we call optimized corrosion control mm -hmm. at all stations. Okay. And that's going to be a major improvement in water quality. Mm -hmm. As we're looking at the same process that we use for corrosion control offer also offers iron sequestration. Mm -hmm. And so really to kind of talk about what is this optimized a corrosion control program, you know, what does it entail? And really what we're looking at doing is, you know, starting out with a desktop assessment and we look at all the uh, various chemical blends that we could use in our system. We look at our water chemistry. Mm -hmm. We look at some of the things such as alkalinity, hardness, what are, what are some of the characteristics of our water mm -hmm. and what are some of these different phosphate blends that would work through it. And mm -hmm. so we do that on the computer and come up with an answer. Mm -hmm. And we come up with a couple different phosphate blends. We're looking at different levels of orthophosphate, different levels of polyphosphate, mm -hmm. and then what concentration are we gonna feed that at in the system. We then take the results from that, uh, what we call kind of desktop work, and then we take it into the lab. Mm -hmm. We do lab scale analysis of, you know, is this gonna work with this system? You know, mm -hmm. what are the water chemistry characteristics that are gonna really give us the best answer? Mm -hmm. Then we take the results from that work and we go kind of what we call a pilot scale where I actually go out to one of our stations uh, and we've done this at three stations where we set up pipe racks, mm -hmm. we set up coupon racks and we go through and we actually uh, do testing with the actual water coming from the station through what is the theoretical best chemical mm -hmm. and then we put it through trials and we run uh, say six week trials on the best selected chemical. We keep going through this process until we land on what is working the best from, you know, what did the calculations tell us? Mm -hmm. What did the lab analysis tell us? Mm -hmm. What did our actual uh, testing in the field verify, corroborate, and mm -hmm. then tell us? And then when we get to the end of all that work, where you have a ideal selected polyphosphate, orthophosphate, blend and feed rate, what concentration are we gonna feed that into the system mm -hmm. at? Mm -hmm. We then go some steps further with it. Mm -hmm. uh, we take a look at our stations. We understand that water demand changes throughout the day. Uh, these stations might go from uh, you know, some sort of low hydraulic output to maximum hydraulic output and everything in between. Sure. And uh, we're looking to automate the feed of those chemicals with that station. So as that station goes up and down, the, the chemical feed would go up and down. So those ratios stay the same. Okay. Uh, we're also looking at, you know, the iron content of that station could change. Mm -hmm. And so we would also have to ratio based on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're looking at inline analyzers that would take a look at that. And then um, continuous feedback loops mm -hmm. through the automation and computer program so that we're taking a look at you know, what are we feeding on the chemical? What's the hydraulics doing? Mm -hmm. Is the end result or dosage where we want it to be? Mm -hmm. And then do we have to bias that up or down? And then we kind of computer control all of that. So that work is in process that started mm -hmm. and it's gonna continue for a couple more years. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in a few years, we will have that implemented. We're gonna implement that in phases mm -hmm. and get to the point where the entire system is completely running on what we call optimized corrosion control major benefits for uh, corrosion control when we talk about lead and copper, sure. but also major benefits when we talk about iron removal mm -hmm. and the iron sequestration. That's great. Yeah, so definitely, you know, there's a lot of great uh, folks working in the labs. There's a lot of people trying to really fi figure out a way to, to um, perfect uh, our system. All right, so Dr Director Baker, uh, you know, this might be a, a overly simplified simplified question, but you know, can you just explain to people, you know, where does where does our water come from? Uh, you know, depending on the different area, you mentioned that it's a uh, a ground well system, um, and uh, just helping people understand and explain a little bit more about where it comes from. I mean, it's a very complex system. You know, you describe it's we have thirteen treatment plants and ninety six active wells, so it, that in itself kind of explains the complexity. But can you kind of just walk us through and explain? Uh, start to finish uh, how it works. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And, I, and you, you kind of helped me 
uh, start off there a little bit. You know, yes, we do have 13 treatment plants. Those mm -hmm. 13 treatment plants are um, supported by 96 active wells. Uh, those are at well fields. Um, we, you know, we didn't talk about what we do have an additional 17 booster and bleacher, booster and bleeder stations, mm -hmm. which help us move water around. But generally, you know, where does that water come from? And we talked earlier about groundwater. It all comes from the ground. And so our system, uh, if you look at a system map, you know, we got kind of a north south extent and we kind of go pretty wide east and west. Um, but our, our system kind of the extents of it in the upper northeast of we've got a well field near kind of Camp Bell Lake area in the, the south lower southwest. We've got a, a well field out in Texas Township at the Al Sable Preserve. Uh, we've got a well field kind of in the, the center core of the city, central. Uh, those are some of our, our, our larger well fields. Uh, and then we also have stations that are kind of near and along West Fork of Portage Creek, uh, Portage Creek, Axtell Creek, Arcadia Creek, near Kalamazoo River and Spring Valley. Now, all these stations are groundwater stations mm -hmm. and they're in those areas. We understand that surface water and groundwater are really highly connected. We're from Michigan and we understand that. Mm -hmm. um, we saw when Lake Michigan was at its highest level all time. Mm -hmm. um, what were things happening in our local area in terms of flooding, in terms of groundwater, in terms of basements? Mm -hmm. So we can kind of relate that groundwater, surface water, they're made, there is these connections and it would make sense that we're getting water from places that have a pretty large abundance of water in terms of aquifer mm -hmm. capacity. Mm -hmm. um, we're drawing from different aquifers, but all of the aquifers that we draw from, really those aquifer capacities are about 150 million gallons per day. Uh -huh. And we currently, with our 96 wells, we've got the capacity to hit uh, around 40 million gallons per day. So there's a tremendous abundancy of groundwater that we're drawing from mm -hmm. with these wells. Now, our well fields, uh, for the most part, are in unconfined aquifers or semi-confined aquifers in that we've got kind of an upper aquifer and we also have a, a lower aquifer. Mm -hmm. We draw from those lower aquifers and in a lot of these areas we're utilizing uh, surface water gradients and surface water pressures mm -hmm. to help that upper aquifer remain positively charged and then we're drawing from the lower aquifer. And we really balance and we manage these well fields by monitoring groundwater USGS gauges. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got many, many gauges that we're actively monitoring. We're also monitoring surface water gauges to kind of understand all the interplay through of that water cycle as everything happens. Okay. And those stations, only 13 of them, really supply that huge area. Mm -hmm. And you know, those plants are everything that we've got to supply this system. Okay, very interesting. And how, uh, remind us again, how many uh, actual like water customers do we have in the system? So we have, from a, if you take our service area, the population of our service area is about 192. 192,000 people. Okay. Now we understand that not everybody has water. You know, some areas, uh, we'll take Oshawa Township, for example. Um, the east half of Oshawa Township is very different than the west half of Oshawa Township. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, our water system runs all the way to the township line, mm -hmm. uh, the west township line mm -hmm. of the Oshawa mm -hmm. system. Active current customers in our system is somewhere in the 130,000 people range oh. uh, but it is it is much bigger than just the city of Kalamazoo right I think that's one thing that a lot of people don't realize you know because they see the city of Kalamazoo logo on the side of trucks or whatever and uh, it's hard for people to understand that but you know that our uh, water system is pretty broad it extends quite a ways out of uh, the city of Kalamazoo um, can you describe some of the municipalities that are in that system so I mean uh, Kalamazoo Township you mentioned you know Ashtamo, um area um, any others that um, you know, are in that system? Yeah, so, you know, we talked about, yeah, obviously City of Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo's got 22 neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, we also serve Kalamazoo Township. Mm -hmm. We serve Comstock Township, okay. Richland Township, Richland Village, Cooper Township, mm -hmm. City of Parchment. Mm -hmm. uh, we serve Oshawa Township, Texas Township. We also serve portions of City of Portage, mm -hmm. that's north of 94. Mm -hmm. And we serve Richland and Richland Village. Okay. 
Uh, so that's quite a, a, a large metro area, if you yep. will, uh, kind of in this area. Uh, Portage, City of Portage does have their own water system, mm. uh, but we serve those customers north of 94. Right. So a lot of things we're talking about, you know, apply to all those customers today as well, Correct. just beyond the city of Kalamazoo, so great. So we talked a little about the, the well uh, fields and you know that being the source of where the water comes from. Can you describe about some of the, the well field protections that we have in place? Um, and then you know it would also be uh, great to hear about the actual like pro water processing and how that works. Yeah, great questions. You know, we, we kind of talked about the well fields where they're located and you know what those wells are looking like. Um, well field protection is an integral part of water quality and that's how we ensure that we maintain water quality. Uh, we have a pretty robust well field protection program um, and we, we have that work through zoning as well. So there, there's zoning limitations if you're in a wellhead protection zone. Mm -hmm. uh, those wellhead protection zones are delineated by what we call time of travel or capture. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have like one year, five year, 10 year. And so we're protecting what the water source is going to be from you know rain that trickles into the ground over one year, five year, and ten years. So we've got those times time of travel, mm -hmm. and really we're looking at you know what are contamination plumes in the ground. What are those plumes doing? Where are they going? Mm -hmm. um, what are their characteristics? What are they made of? Is there a treatment that we can employ that's going to uh, make that so it's not an issue, um, or do we have to? decommission a station or shut a station down to mm -hmm. prevent something. Mm -hmm. And you know, something to talk about in when PFAS really first started to come around and we transitioned in testing from doing our uh, unregulated contaminant testing and monitoring mm -hmm. um, to transitioning into uh, being able to get much more sophisticated with PFAS. Mm -hmm. You know, we transitioned and saw that uh, we had two stations that we had some concern with in terms of, you know, could we ensure that over the life cycle of that well, mm -hmm. uh, would we not, you know, pull in PFAS? And, you know, where is the PFAS coming from or what are the concerns with that? So, you know, we actually decommissioned two stations uh, because we just didn't have the confidence that you know, we knew where that PFAS was coming from, mm -hmm. uh, that we knew that we could keep it out of the wells and that, um, that PFAS levels weren't gonna be something that could at some point be over an MCL. And so those stations were decommissioned and shut down uh, prior to the state of Michigan issuing MCLs for uh, PFAS, the MCLs that they are today. Mm -hmm. We have another station where we've identified a PFAS plume within less than a mile of the station. And we're monitoring that plume. We're trying to understand the movement of that plume. Mm -hmm. And we have a need for that station to become what we call a baseload station. Mm -hmm. So our response to that is uh, modification and upgrade to that station. We're going to employ iron removal, manganese removal, and then ultimately PFOS removal at that station. And what that will enable us to do is run that station under a baseload uh, um, configuration and if we start to pull that PFOS plume closer to us we're protected mm -hmm. because we're going to employ full-scale PFOS removal at that station. Mm -hmm. So these are all the things that well have protection really looks to do and we're doing that looking out on the horizon we're doing it before there's a problem. Taking a proactive approach. We're taking yeah. a proactive approach so that each and every day we can deliver clean safe drinking water to residents to have. Mm -hmm. And that's where the program's successful. Mm -hmm. The program's not successful if we have to announce uh, consumption uh, order or do not drink order because we've got a chemical in the water. Right. Uh, we want to make sure that we find that stuff ahead of time mm -hmm. so that we can either reconfigure the stations and pull from other areas mm -hmm. so that we can employ treatment mm -hmm. uh, or we can do something ahead of time so that we can protect the drinking water. So a lot of, you know, part of what we're paying for in our water system effectively is, you know, those safeguards and, you know, that monitoring uh, where the experts are, you know, uh, forecasting and, you know, um, making sure that there's the quality that we, we want in um, each faucet. So we talked a little bit about the, uh, the wells, so being the source. So from, from the well to your faucet, you know, what happens in between there? Yeah, that's a great question. So we've got those 13 treatment plants we talked about. Now, two of those plants 
have um, oxidation towers mm -hmm. followed by full-scale iron removal. Mm -hmm. um, the remaining 11 stations have, for the most part, what we call iron sequestration, mm -hmm. and that's where we use a, a phosphate treatment technique uh, to provide that sequestration. Mm -hmm. All stations utilize a phosphate treatment technique for corrosion control. We also have a pretty sophisticated chlorine treatment system where we completely disaffect and then maintain a chlorine residual within the distribution system mm -hmm. to protect against any contaminants or uh, biological uh, contamination. And then we also provide fluoride treatment at all the stations. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and so once, uh, once they're at those stations, then the, um, they're basically pumped or pushed then through the, the lines and then that's when it eventually ends up at your, your faucet. Basically. Correct. Yeah. Once it's out of the, once it's uh, finished water mm -hmm. from the treatment plant mm -hmm. and it goes out to the distribution system, mm -hmm. now it's in the distribution system. It's going through the transmission mains, mm -hmm. distribution mains. Mm -hmm. It's going up into the towers and back down from the towers. Sure. And then it's also going through what we call our booster and bleeder stations. And those stations enable us to really move water between districts, to take water from a district uh, that may be in periods of low demand and bring it over to water. Uh, district that's experiencing high demand. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you. That's hopefully gives people somewhat of an explanation so they understand how that works. Uh, you know, because like you mentioned, you know, we're the largest, you said the largest groundwater system in the state of Michigan. So, you know, that definitely makes us pretty unique in terms of what people might be used to or what other communities uh, utilize or deploy. All right, so Director Baker, uh, you know, we're just getting through uh, a long winter here. Uh, seems like no matter what neighborhood you're in, you, you see the trucks with the, the lights flashing and, you know, seems like there's oh, another water main break uh, somewhere. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, um, talk, talk a little bit about that process and why that's happening and, um, you know, I know you've, you've talked to, to us a few times as well about how, um, you know, a lot of those tend to be the old cast iron pipes and, you know, after, um, I think it was in 1964, the, the ductile type form of, of pipes. Um, and just explain how that impacts what people are seeing and can you just kind of describe to us like, you know, what it looks like. Is it is it unique to some neighborhoods or is it kind of happening geographically everywhere? And um, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit. No, that's a great that. question. You know, folks see a water main break and, and you know, really there's a lot of questions there at that point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see the, the greatest determining factors on, on water main breaks are uh, pipe condition, material, mm -hmm. age, and then also break history. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've done a lot of research into our system. We've taken a lot of look at uh, pipe material and we have a good understanding of what pipe material is experiencing main breaks and what pipe material is more resilient to mm -hmm. that. And so we look at uh, cast iron pipe or plain cast iron pipe. We understand that uh, that pipe is rather brittle it doesn't respond well to movement in the soil. Mm -hmm. And when we you know, kind of transition into cold weather and frost, and then we transition back out of it, the ground is moving. You know, the, the ground outside you know, can move vertically up to, to four inches. If you went from like July to July, and you had instruments that were sophisticated enough to measure say a, a point in the ground mm -hmm. and you watch its movement over a year, mm -hmm. uh, you would see that the ground actually can, can kind of move up and down as much as, as four inches. Wow. And uh, different soil types will move differently and different soil types will behave differently. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that uh, clay reacts a little bit different than the, the sands and gravels do. And mm -hmm. what happens when the ground starts to move, it's really exerting a lot of force and, and pressure on these pipes, these pipes are brittle, mm -hmm. and they can't—they uh, can't move with it. Mm -hmm. And when the, that pressure overcomes their strength, they—they they burst. Uh, there's also a uh, external corrosion component to that. We also have a lot of main breaks that are because the external jacket of the pipe has uh, been in the ground so long that the soils are actually starting to corrode it, yeah. which causes little pits, mm -hmm. and then those pits are forms or areas of weakness mm -hmm. that further limit the pipe's ability to withstand uh, those movements. Now, in 1964, 
the city transitioned and started using a pipe material known as ductile iron pipe. Okay. Um, for the most part, they look very similar. Uh, there is a, it's an iron pipe, right? Mm -hmm. Now the ductile iron pipe uh, actually can move a lot more than the cast iron pipe. It's not as brittle. Okay. It also has what we call beam strength. It can support those soil loads as that soil is moving around. Mm -hmm. And that pipe has not experienced the main breaks that we have seen with the cast iron pipe. Um, you know, we've got 57 years worth of credibility and justification that we're using the right pipe material. Mm -hmm. But we're still using that ductile iron pipe today. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a lot of success with that uh, pipe material. So as replacements are happening, you know, now that we've kind of settled on the material that works best, it's, it's somewhat reassuring to know that we're uh, replacing it with material that's built to last, basically. Um, has a little bit more reliability. How are, um, when people, when, when a water main break happens, you know, what are some of the ways that people can tell that it's happened? You know, what are some of the cues that people could uh, deduce to say, okay, yeah, I think this is a water main break, you know, I should call this in. Um, yeah, that's a great question. You know, believe it or not, the city does not have, you know, we don't have in our control room an automated system that tells us when main breaks happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got 800 miles of pipe, and when main breaks happen, our best resource to let us know that something's going on is calls from the public, sure. uh, calls from our own staff that are out in the field that see it, mm -hmm. calls from public safety yeah. that see it. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's motorists that are on their uh, way home from work from the graveyard shift or something like that. Sure. Um, on a homeowner level, um, if you turn the faucet on, nothing comes out, mm. that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Give us a call right away. Mm -hmm. There's probably a main break happening. Okay. Um, and instantaneous change in aesthetic water quality. Mm -hmm. There's yellow water for no reason. Mm -hmm. And we talked about those transient and acute events. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the leading causes of that is a main break. Okay. It might not be a main break on your street, but it might be the next street over. Mm -hmm. um, and the more calls that we receive, that really help us to kind of determine it. Okay. Now, there are catastrophic main breaks, mm -hmm. and we've experienced uh, typically one or more of those a year. Those are main breaks that are so catastrophic that when they happen, they will literally explode a hole in the road. Is that like a good example, like Crosstown? Crosstown is a great <laughs> example yeah. of that. Yeah. It literally exploded a hole in the road, mm -hmm. shifted the entire pavement cross section, which is you know somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 12 inches thick, wow. lifted it up. I mean, it looked like an earthquake happened. And that there. was that was a, a already a problem area, right? That crosstown area as well. And I mean, those those pipes, if I recall correctly, were from like the 19 teens and 1920s old, right? I mean, they were Correct. old, old. Those were old <laughs> pipes in the neighborhood of 100 years old. Huh. Um, they were the brittle pipe material. Mm -hmm. uh, they, those pipes were also experiencing external corrosion. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of had the perfect storm. We yep. had a catastrophic main break uh, situation there, I think two years in a row, which ultimately led to the replacement that we did. So in, you guys took much more area. like intensive, like let's just tackle this and proactively try to you know prevent it from future catastrophic issues like Correct. that as well. So yeah. Correct. So it was definitely worth the inconvenience of traffic <laughs> and the, the closures of the street for a little while uh, to get that up and running. So yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, this is really interesting. I think it, it's especially interesting to know that um, you know, that we recognize and we understand, you know, what it seems to be the major cause of, of the breaks. Do you get a sense, I mean, is it, do you find that there are some neighborhoods that are worse than others in terms of the water main breaks uh, in the city of Kalamazoo? Have you noticed that there are some years where it's worse than others, uh, just system-wide? I mean, what's, what, are you, what are you seeing? So, you know, that's a great question. We, we usually average somewhere, you know, in the main break season, let's call it November, through March, mm -hmm. and then, and like I said, that's when the ground is moving the most mm -hmm. uh, in response to frost and temperature changes. Mm -hmm. And you know, we we track main breaks on an annual basis, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, it's kind of like winter. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so is winter in nineteen twenty or is it twenty twenty one? And mm -hmm. so you, you're always kind of you've got one foot in last year, one mm -hmm. foot in this year, but. Yeah. Uh, even understanding the the split of that, we average 80 to 100 main breaks per year, okay. and that's been pretty consistent. You can look back over a five-year period, 
you can look back over a 10 year period okay. and we're still in the 80 to 100 main break okay. uh, per year range. And um, you know what is also helpful is looking at a map of main break occurrences mm -hmm. and you can see they're all kind of, you know, what we would call say the city proper and then kind of expanding, spilling over the line into Kalamazoo Township. And mm -hmm. it, it comes back to that older cast iron main. Yeah. Uh, when we get out into the new parts of the system, new as in 1964 current, uh, mm -hmm. new as in 57 years old and, mm -hmm. and newer, well, we're just not seeing that. Mm -hmm. um, now we have responded out in say the, the those newer areas when folks hit a hydrant mm -hmm. so hard with the crash velocities and the, the crash energies are so catastrophic that mm -hmm. not only does the hydrant break, but that pipe that goes then six foot into the ground breaks and then breaks off the main. And it's wow. a pretty uh, intense crash, but you know, in the wintertime, uh, things do happen. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, it's kind of everywhere is uh, seeing that. Now, we have noticed uh, some tendencies on pipe installed from about 1940s mm -hmm. uh, to, to early 1950s. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I had to grab a 10 year period, I'd grab from 1942 to about 1952. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the pipe that was installed during this time period it was kind of during World War II mm -hmm. and kind of right after World War II. Mm -hmm. And we understand that there was some changes in the metallurgy, there were some changes in the source um, iron material to, to make the pipes. Obviously there was a big demand for iron mm -hmm. for something else during mm -hmm. that time period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would appear to us that there was potentially a little bit of a learning curve uh, for pipe manufacturer during that time period. So we are seeing a little bit of an increase okay. uh, at some of that pipe. That pipe is uh, part of our uh, cast iron pipe replacement program where we look at major street projects mm -hmm. that are um, in our LAP or local agency plan. Mm -hmm. Those are projects that we're doing usually in coordination with CATS. And we're always gonna take a look at those projects mm -hmm. and we're always gonna take a look at that through an asset management lens mm -hmm. and understand if we're gonna do this reconstruction on the street, is this also a good time to replace that water main? Just get it all done. Just do get it all, it all done at once. Which, you know, in the long run too, is gonna save taxpayers a lot of money as well. And, you know, inconvenience too. Uh, just having to shut down a road multiple times because you're, you're piecemealing the replacement. And, you know, like the budget model you're describing is, you know, being very intentional and thoughtful about thinking through Project so you can just get it all done in one swoop, which is great to see. And we've seen that happen on some pretty major ones here. Uh, we just saw Cork Street, uh, yep. Oakland Drive. Um, we got Portage uh, Street happening this year. So all of those were very thoughtful and fully integrated projects where, you know, whether it comes from like sidewalk replacement or all those different things happening all at once, which is which is great to see. And I think, you know, uh, as, as residents of Kalamazoo, we should all be pretty proud of the fact that we have a community that's thinking about those sort of things to not only, you know, be great stewards of taxpayer dollars, but also, you know, just trying to think through inconvenience and just logistics of, of getting all that done in one swoop. Right, that's certainly what we don't want to happen. We don't want uh, to spend all summer long with Cork Street shut mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. and then brand new pavement and it just opens to the public mm -hmm. and we're driving on it mm -hmm. for the first times in the fall into the winter. And then as soon as winter hits, we close the road because we had a water main break right. and we dig up all that brand new pavement. Right. Um, we want to operate differently than that. Mm -hmm. We want to coordinate projects uh, and take a look at it. Now, that doesn't mean that every street is going to get new water main, right? Um, but we are taking an intentional look. We're looking at, okay, uh, what is the break history in this area? Mm -hmm. What's the pipe age condition? You know, mm -hmm. when is it? Was it during that, you know, 1942 to 1952 period? Mm -hmm. Is it 112 years old? Right. You know, is this the right time to replace this main? Right. Or can we make a decision? Can it go another 10 years? Mm -hmm. And we can come back to it with a main replacement project 10 or 15 years from now. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, you've mentioned this to me before as well, but uh, you know, the importance of, of doing it in a pro uh, aggressive and proactive enough rate that, you know, we don't ever get ourselves to a point as a community where we can't keep up with them. Um, so we're, we're trying to stay ahead of that curve where it gets to a point of, um, not being able to re effectively respond, uh, you know, in a, in a, at a level of response that the public come, has come to expect. 
Uh, and so, uh, you know, and especially I, I can describe again how many miles of line, uh, it, it's a lot. I mean, it's hundreds of miles. And, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's great to hear that we're, you know, trying to uh, you know, update as much as we can uh, as part of our capital improvement plan. No, that's a great point. I mean, uh, right now today we have around 150 miles of water main mm -hmm. that's 100 years old or older. Wow. And that's out of 800 miles of a system. Yeah. Now, when we get to the year 2037, we're going to add 300 more miles to that list okay. of being 100 years old or older. That's and if you look cool. at right now, we've got 80 to 100 main breaks per year. Uh, you know, so the question kind of is the do nothing approach, the, mm -hmm. you know, rates fund the water infrastructure. We've got a very aggressive capital improvement plan. Mm -hmm. We understand uh, where the rates are and we do understand rate impacts. However, if we take a look at the do nothing approach mm -hmm. and we say we're responding to 100 uh, main breaks a year and we're just going to continue on that process. Mm -hmm. Well. 2037 isn't too far down the road for us. Right. And if we do nothing with the current set of water main and we have no plan to do nothing with that additional 300 miles that we hit in mm -hmm. 2037, mm -hmm. what is our ability with our current staffing mm -hmm. to respond to the number of annual main breaks that we will have under a do nothing approach in the year 2037? Yeah. And if we talk about rates, one of our biggest expenses is staff mm -hmm. and uh, you know our s size of the department the amount of staff that we have is very expensive mm -hmm. that is one of the big drivers of rates as is the capital program mm -hmm. and we also look at reliability and the ability to have the water when you turn it on mm -hmm. so under a do-nothing approach a staff limited approach uh, it wouldn't be hard to imagine the year 2037 and having to respond to 150 main breaks a year, not having the staff to do it. Mm -hmm. And the response at that point would be, thank you for the call. We understand that the water is not running. We understand that there is a main break currently tearing the street up. Mm -hmm. Our public services department will be there in four days. Mm -hmm. That is a scary situation. And we never want to get to that point. We you never know, want to get to yeah. that point. So, you know, that's the, you know, again, you know, we've talked about this at commission meetings as well about, you know, we, we recognize we want to be very thoughtful if we're ever going to make rate increases. But just recognizing that, you know, we've had decades where we have been unable or, you know, d decided not to take aggressive capital improvements in many cases. And, you know, we want to um, not only catch up, but be ahead of the curve. And so that's going to, you know, uh, take that aggressive approach. And so, uh, you know, that's great to hear. I think that um, hopefully that's reassuring to people that we're being thoughtful about that and uh, trying to keep up as much as we can. And, and also recognizing for people that, it, you know, if people are seeing it in their neighborhood, they're probably not alone. It's, it's, it is happening, um, you know, throughout the, the city because there's a lot of aged piping throughout the whole city. So a, another question I hear pretty frequently from, from residents is, uh, you know, so, well, you know, I, I haven't seen people out on my street in a while. You know, I, I see a pothole there, you know, I, you know, I've seen the water main breaks, you know, how do I know if it's going to be my turn to get a, a new street or, you know, new, uh, new water pipes or whatever installed in my neighborhood? You know, what's a good way for people if they want to do a little exploring and dig up and dig and find, you know, when, when, is, when is something happening in my neighborhood or my area? Yeah, that's a great question. Certainly, you know, citizens want to see what projects are going to be happening in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, one, so that they're aware of them. And two, if they don't see projects, so they can reach out and communicate with uh, commissioners and staff on, on, on project needs. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the best resources for that is to look at what we call our capital improvement plans. Uh, these are five-year plans and they're part of every city budget. Mm -hmm. So if you can uh, access a link and get to the city budget, uh, you can even, if you, if you don't have uh, internet resources or something like that, you can request a copy of the, the city budget mm -hmm. uh, from the city. Mm -hmm. And so within that city budget, look at the spot that talks about capital improvement plans. Mm -hmm. And each department has a plan in there. And so if you're looking at water projects, you'd want to look at the capital improvement plan for water. Mm -hmm. And that's going to detail out at least five years mm -hmm. of work. And so they'll just have a, a list of projects and years. Mm -hmm. Now, 
in a lot of water projects, these are big projects, a lot of times they're funded over multiple years. Mm -hmm. And so you'll wanna look at over several years uh, because there could be, say, a project that might hit a couple years, mm -hmm. uh, but be the, be the same project. Mm -hmm. uh, streets are the same way. You can look and find street projects uh, in the street plan, mm -hmm. and uh, same with water and uh, sewer. Uh, getting outside of uh, public services, you can look at other departments as well to see what, what projects they're working on. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the, the best place to start. Mm -hmm. um, now when we've got some bigger projects, uh, we're utilizing some web links to give uh, almost real-time information on progress or to provide information on where we're at, where we're gonna go next. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like the lead service line, mm -hmm. replacement projects, for example. Uh, we've got a web link. It shows you our progress since 2017. Sure. It shows you dots on every single home we completed. You've got bar charts that show you annual statistics on replacements. Yeah. Uh, we've got maps that show you kind of an area boundary of where we're at now and mm -hmm. then where we're gonna be next year mm -hmm. as well in the coming years. Um, there's all the projects such as township, uh, water main extensions that are happening that kind of follow the same basis. Mm -hmm. They'll show you a project map, uh, show you what, what streets we're working on mm -hmm. and where we're going. That's great. Yeah, it's great. And I know as well, like, you know, this year being able to say to w which neighborhoods, you know, you're getting a lead line replacement and whatnot, you know, that's all somewhat forecasted as well, which is great to see. Um, you know, in terms of, uh, you, you mentioned that community input, you know, and, and helping us identify areas that might need to be prioritized higher or, or whatever. You know, so, I mean, obviously they can reach out to us as commissioners, but, um, you know, they can also reach out, you know, 311, they can they can reach out to different email addresses with the city for, for city input. But I also know, um, you know, if, if somebody notices that's, that a light's out or, you know, there's a pothole or there's a traffic signal issue as well, people can report those as well, correct? Correct, correct. So something like a pothole or a street light that's out, that's pretty much an instantaneous fix. Okay. You know, there's something, if you give us a call, you've got a known intersection or, you know, an address block, say the 100 block of mm -hmm. uh, West North Street, and there's a pothole there. We mm -hmm. can respond to that and we can come out and fix that. Yeah. And same with the, the street light, you can make a report, the mm -hmm. street light is out. Mm -hmm. uh, we can get that information over to consumers and get it on their list uh, to, you know, repair. So that's not necessarily a project, uh, but it's something that the city needs to be responsive and report uh, to repair or re respond to yeah for sure but that input is valuable you know to hear if, if, if uh, you know enough people if, you, if the city starts to identify that enough people are identifying a certain area that's you know really needs attention or something like that it definitely raises it on the radar a little bit so it's it's helpful to hear from people um, in those situations yeah certainly sure. and also the, the neighborhood associations as well mm -hmm. if you if you live in a neighborhood that has an active neighborhood association mm -hmm. and You've got uh, you know some wide neighborhood concerns. Mm -hmm. Hey, this we looked at the streets plan. We looked five years out, and you know this street, that street, they're not anywhere on your plan. They're falling apart, and we need some help. Mm -hmm. You know, get that elevated to the neighborhood level, mm -hmm. um, and that helps because we look uh, to support for projects from neighborhood organizations mm -hmm. and a community as well, mm -hmm. and that's going to help inform us on our project decisions also. Great. So, Director Baker, uh, we uh, just one more more question for you. You know, frequently people will hear about a boil water advisory. Maybe they hear about it on the news, or you know, see it on a news article, or um, you know, see it in a social post. But can you just tell us a little bit about you know, you know, how those are determined to be, be announced, and you know, how they determine the proximity of of where they're going to put a boil advisory on, and then maybe just a little bit about you know, what are the places people can go to if they're if they're wondering if their area is impacted. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we uh, we talked earlier about main breaks, um, 80 to 100 main breaks a year, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of boil water advisories are in relationship to the work that we're doing mm -hmm. on the pipes. Sure. Um, and really, all boil water advisory is is uh, an extra step of protection mm -hmm. that we want to make sure that we're communicating to the public mm -hmm. um, when we're working on the water infrastructure, mm. uh, when we've got pipes apart, uh, when we're closing valves and decreasing pressure in the mains, uh, we wanna make sure that we're protecting the public. Mm -hmm. uh, under Michigan law on Public Act 399, uh, these are essentially the drinking water rules mm. at the state level. Mm -hmm. 
that uh, require a boil water advisory be issued anytime pressure uh, within the water system, even an isolated area of water system, drops below 20 psi. Okay. Now, if the water main uh, is under pressure that's gr you know above 20 psi, uh, we know that that nothing else is going to get in mm -hmm. uh, that water main because it, uh, the the pressure gradients are, are opposite. Think about a, a water main that's under 60 or 70 psi and groundwater that's under two psi at the most, mm. uh, that groundwater is not gonna get into that main. Sure. Now, when we close valves, we isolate that main, we cut it open, mm. uh, we could introduce bacteria into that main. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we, uh, understanding Public Act 399, understanding what the risk is to the public if there was a bacterial uh, issue, uh, we isolate, uh, we issue those boil water advisories, and then we conduct sampling. Mm -hmm. And we will not lift the boil water advisory until we've got uh, a series of successful samples that prove and verify that nothing got into the main and that everything is uh, protected mm -hmm. in terms of drinking water uh, protection. So yeah. really it's something that we do to help uh, not only notify the public, um, but to help protect the public against any risk. And really everything is out of an abundance of caution. Sure. And then, uh, you know, where are the places people can go to, to uh, look to see if they're under a boil, boil water advisory? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if it's a small area, most oftentimes we will hand deliver those. We'll oh. actually, post those on the, the front door of oh, the residence. Okay. Uh, we also, on uh, the city's website, in the top left corner, we've got a listing of all the boil water advisories mm -hmm. uh, when it was issued and then when it was lifted. Mm -hmm. um, and I also uh, want to also talk about the difference between a boil water advisory and a boil water order. Okay. So the boil water advisory is uh, us, you know, essentially saying, hey, there could be a risk. Uh, we want to make sure you protect yourselves. Mm. Uh, we haven't detected any bacteria, mm. but w there was a pressure drop. Mm -hmm. We dropped the pressure down, and so under Public Act 399, we're required to take this step. Yeah. Now, a boil water order, uh, which to my knowledge, we have not issued one. Yeah, mm -hmm. a boil water order means we've found bacteria, okay. and we know there's a problem, and there is uh, situation here and it's sort sure. of kind of like a tornado watch mm -hmm. or tornado warning sure and so there's different degrees yeah. of classification sure. there okay uh, in terms of you know how do we determine where the areas are it always comes back to valve isolation mm -hmm. so when we have a main break or we have an infrastructure repair that we're gonna accomplish we isolate valves you know it might be three valves we shut to isolate this section of main, mm -hmm. it might be five valves or seven valves, mm -hmm. and given the location of where those valves are is the location of where that boil water advisory is. Mm -hmm. Now this can be confusing, we understand that. Mm -hmm. As you might uh, be on a street that's named, your street got named in a boil water advisory, mm -hmm. but your house is not selected. Mm -hmm. You may wonder, well, if they selected the street, why is my house not on it? Sure. And again, this comes back to those valves. Okay. So there could be a valve on a cross street, or mm -hmm. there could be a valve, say, mid-block that we closed and isolated so that, you know, everything within this area saw that pressure drop. Yeah. But the valves and everything behind the valves and these other areas, we were able to maintain pressure. Okay. That's great. So uh, people can check it out on our website. You mentioned what area of the website they can find that, but also like the URL, the, the website link is kalamazoocity.org slash BWA or Correct. Sorry, Boil Water Advisory. short for Boil Water Advisory. And then, you know, we're on Facebook and we're on Twitter and I know um, our team at the city has been doing a great job uh, trying to get those posted as quickly as possible, both um, letting people know when they're happening, but also letting people know when they expire as well. So we appreciate that as well. Um, and then, uh, like you said, they, some people in some cases might actually get, you know, physical notification on their door. So, Correct. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of different ways to find out then. And, and that's in addition to the, what the media, you know, uh, puts out there as well, depending on wh where it happened and when. So anyways, well, thanks for that explanation. Hopefully that helps people understand a little bit better about why that happens and, and what to do. Yeah. Well, Director Baker, I really appreciate your time. I know you're a very busy individual and, uh, 
you, there's always things that you're, are pulling your attention in different directions, but I really appreciate you taking out the time to you know, educate the public and inform the public about you know, how our system that we depend on. And, and, and largely, you know, I think we take for granted. So thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. You know, our goal uh, today and every day is to provide clean, safe drinking water mm -hmm. for the public, mm -hmm. um, as well as you know, provide wastewater treatment and uh, provide a uh, better situation for the environment. And, you know, really all this work that we talked about, a lot of great work is, you know, really made possible by the 201 unique, dedicated individuals that make up the Department of Public Services. Mm -hmm. And uh, our folks are here every day committed to this work, com committed to this community mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that uh, we're here to serve and protect the public. Yeah. Uh, we really honor that position. We honor that work. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the time. Yeah.